Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, Silence is Not an Option, Allyship, Advocacy, and Anti-Racism. My name is Jenny Frankel, and I'm the Associate Director of the Museum of Public Relations, the world's only museum dedicated to the public relations profession. We welcome you all to visit us online at prmuseum.org, where you can also see more upcoming events, including the first ever PR Museum event honoring Native American Heritage Month on November 11th, and our annual fundraiser, which will be the PR industry's first ever talent show, PR's Got Talent, live on November 30th. Auditions are now open and we urge everyone in the profession to send in their demos. Today we have a panel of cross-generational communications and DEI leaders who will discuss the current state of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the workplace and emphasize a call to action for individual accountability and commitment to DEI across all levels of an organization. Before we start, I would like to say a quick thanks to those who made tonight's event possible. ProSec, Your Choice Coach, the Museum of Public Relations, of course, the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communications, Department of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of Georgia, Compro, and Muckrack. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's MC and moderator, Lynn Applebaum, Professor Emirata of the City College of New York. Lynn Applebaum has over 30 years of experience as a public relations professional and educator, working in public and private sectors in media relations and strategic communications. As senior PR faculty at the city, through, through her research about diversity and advocacy for her students, she is a longtime proponent of fostering inclusion within the PR profession. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much, Jenny, uh, and the Museum of Public Relations, and to all our sponsors this evening. It's an honor for me to moderate this event, and thank you to all our panelists, our keynote speakers, and our audience for this important discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Tonight's program will begin with the keynote address followed by two panel discussions, and we'll wrap up with an audience Q&A. We'll conclude with brief remarks by our host from the Museum of PR. Please share your questions in the Q&A section on the Zoom, and we'll get to them as many as we can after our second panel concludes. We've got a lot to cover and we're on a tight schedule, so let's get started. I'm honored to present our keynote speakers Aurora Archer and Kelly Croce Sorg from The Opt In. The Opt In is a thought provoking podcast, learning community, and culture shifting consulting practice focused on racial literacy, equity, and justice. So, Kelly and Aurora, as I introduce you, would you please turn on your cameras and your mics? Great. Uh, a little about Aurora. Aurora is an Afro-Latina who hustled up the corporate ladder to the executive suite and yet still experienced the same implicit bias, microaggressions, and overt racism as her parents who spent their lives working as domestic service workers while raising Aurora in Texas. After 25 years of marketing awards and promotions, Aurora realized that there had to be a better way to use her talents without sacrificing her true self and health for the sake of white corporate profit. So in 2018, Aurora partnered with her white best friend, Kelly Croce Sorg, to form the opt-in. Let me tell you a little bit about Kelly. White, wealthy, and in her words, willfully ignorant, Kelly grew up self-described, uber-privileged as the daughter of an NBA team owner. Always seeking self-improvement, Kelly thought she was woke until Aurora gave her the book, White Fragility by Dr. Robin DiAngelo. 
radically shifting her worldview and inspiring her to address her own internalized racism to become a real friend to Aurora. In all their work together, Kelly dives deep into the uncomfortable but necessary conversations with her bestie Aurora in what she calls a love letter to her white friends and family, advocating for them all to do better, including herself. And so over to you, Kelly and Aurora, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Lynn. We appreciate uh, that beautiful introduction. Hello, everyone. We see Phillies in the house, Sacramento's in the house. Um, my name is Aurora Archer. I'm an Afro-Latina. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the proud product of Hugh Archer, an African-American cook, and Patricia Gámez, a Mexican immigrant housekeeper. I grew up in between worlds. I spent my summers in Monterrey, Mexico with my abuelita because as domestics, as Lynn shared, my parents couldn't afford summer childcare. I spent my Sundays at barbecues, eating ribs and black eyed peas with my grandmother and making up dance routines to the latest R&B hits with my cousin. I spent my time after school helping my parents clean and look after the homes and children of wealthy white families in the suburbs of San Antonio. The complexity and the richness of my younger years experience made me adaptable, made me an incredible and keen observer of human beings, resilient and determined to climb the corporate American ladder. And I did. I did it as a marketing and communications executive, making change all along the way up that ladder at some of the most renowned global brands and companies. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly. I go by she and her. And as Lynn said, among my many privileges, I am white. And I grew up extremely privileged. My dad was this quintessential uh, American dream story, this rags to riches story. And I identified very closely and dearly with this story for most of my life. Um, when I was young, I was in public relations as an account manager. And back then the media was just newspapers, magazines, and television. So you all have a much harder job than I had then. And thanks to my generational wealth, I was able to work in entrepreneurial businesses, raise my children at home uh, most of my adult life. As Lynn said, I've always been a self-seeker, and thankfully, my parents have always been lifelong learners. And yet, after being friends with Aurora for over a decade, it took the book White Fragility coming out and her gifting it to me with love, along with over 30 other white friends and colleagues, for me to read that book and realize that it actually wasn't those white people that we were talking about we were talking about me and we were talking about my family. We were talking about my friends and I was realizing uh, just a hint of how unself-aware I was about my story. Everything I thought to be true was now in question. Um, the founding of our country, this um, rags to riches story looked darn near impossible if my dad had been black or brown in his life. I thought I knew myself, but you know, we as communications and PR people would never write or pitch a story without knowing the whole thing. We love every angle to be able to use. And in not knowing my race or my racial story, the story of myself was extremely incomplete. I had a lot of racial literacy to build. So for me, when I read the words about this event, it's silence, allyship, advocacy, anti-racism, a lot of stuff comes up for me. So I could spend a lot of time on silence and how that's perfectionism. I was silent for 40 years of my life. It's a defense mechanism. It's a tenant of white supremacy culture. But I wanna turn right now to the words allyship and anti-racism. 
I get the word allyship. It works, right? It's a rallying cry. It's a call to action. However, I don't use it. In my cross-racial connection and close relationship with Aurora, as I've become more aware to Aurora's lived experience, and I've witnessed the direct and opposite experience I've had as a white woman. To be her ally would actually mean that I was by her side, in support of her, in her battle. However, racism's my problem to solve. Aurora was waiting the majority of our relationship for me to wake up, to hear her, that she'd been signaling to me, and I couldn't hear her. She was telling me, this is in you. I'm not her ally. I'm the problem. I've embodied these white ideals and it's my job to dismantle them internally, interpersonally, and ultimately institutionally and systemically. We as white people are being called to transform and dismantle this delusion of a hierarchy of human value in ourselves, and in all of its forms. With the opt-in, we talk a lot about stamina. When it comes to personal transformation, oftentimes people don't change, or they get stuck, or we stall. And that's often because we aren't solving the right problem. And we have to go back to that element. Are we solving for the right problem? And we haven't solved racism because we haven't addressed the problem that needs to be solved. And that is white supremacy culture. And I grew up in white supremacy culture. When I actually, when I read the tenants, I was like, oh my gosh, I thought this was the checklist and we were supposed to do these things as well as possible. And I was really, really good at them. And we all know that words matter. And in doing my own work, I started to notice that it was actually easier for me to say anti-racism and fight against racism and diversity because those things were like out here. But when I tease out like, what is racism? What am I actually saying in that word? It's the proliferation of racist thoughts and ideals. Okay, so what's the, what are racist thoughts and ideals? Well, it's a power structure in which one race is worth more than other races. Okay, it's a hierarchy of human value. What race is more valuable than other races? Whiteness. So when we say diversity, we're saying diverse from what? Whiteness. And we always always known this. It just took me some extra time. So, but now we know the problem, right? So we aren't actually an ally solving the problem. We are inherent in solving the problem. DEI isn't out here for the melanated people to solve. It's got to be centered in everything that we do. And when I say we, I mean white people. So for my story, I didn't have a racial lens to tell it until much recently, much more recently. And this is all historically by design. So I'm not shaming myself when I say that. And yet still today, even yesterday, if I'm not racially self-aware, all of my behaviors will be consistent with normalizing whiteness. And I make mistakes all of the time. Just ask Aurora. We're not actually in the work if we're not making mistakes. But we must develop a racial lens, especially in PR and communications. I mean, when we look at, we expect a DEI person in a company or a, or a CDO, a chief diversity officer, to be this filter in the company in which everything goes through and then comes out racially competent. It sounds like a gargantuan task, probably a futile effort. But instead, if like all of us are working on our racial competency, our, and we're all becoming more racially aware, we're in closer connection with each other, not just to white people, we are building the stamina to stay in this journey and together, then we create expansive work that will resonate beyond our mediocre delusion.
reflection of white supremacy culture. And when we get racially confident, we have the foundation to figure out exactly what we need wherever we are. That's not easy. It takes work. And we can share with you our theory of change. So make sure you connect with us after. Once we become racially confident, we're so much more open and curious and honest and non-judgmental. And we have a racial lens that guides us. It's messy and it's clear all at the same time. Everything makes sense though. It's the most essential skill in adulthood for any person in any industry. And we need not fear it because we can do it and we must. And so our ask, our invitation to all of you who have taken the time to join us today is to immediately get on the path of racial competence. Opt in. Own your self-awareness. It's your work to understand yourself as much as it was my work to understand myself. Build the racial literacy. Understand race. How was it made? How does it show up today? How does it show up literally in everything? Third, connect. Connect with people who do not look like you. This takes effort. Start, it's easy, buy black. Put your money and energy into BIPOC businesses and communities. Easiest way to start. Fourth but not least, stamina. Stay in it. It's a journey. It's a bumpy ride. Kelly and I have had our series of ups and downs. But you can do this. We can do this together. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having us. Wow. Thank you so much, Kelly and Arar. That was uh, inspirational. And thank you for sharing your journey and your path to reconciliation. Um, and especially for sharing some very tangible steps that we can all start to take uh, on this journey that, that you are traveling and are leading. So thank you for that. Um, I want to remind everybody that Kelly and Aurora will be available to take your questions at the end of our event. But if there's something that they said that inspired you now and you don't want to wait, uh, we won't answer your question now, but feel free to post it in the Q&A now and we'll address it later. Thank you again, ladies. And so now let's move on to our first panel for a deeper dive into the following areas. This panel will be addressing how we engage in difficult conversations and understand what we can do to become anti-racist. We'll be talking about the types of inclusive behavior and actions that employees should take to cultivate an environment of belonging. And lastly, we'll be talking about how to identify the inequities in the workplace and as importantly, or more importantly, to speak up when we see these disparities. So uh, panel, our first panel, uh, welcome uh, to Simone Sloan, Troy Blackwell, and Kelly Fuller. Would you each please turn on your cameras so I can in introduce you while you're on screen? Thank you one and all. Uh, here's a little bit of an introduction for each of our panelists. Simone Sloan is the founder and CEO of Your Choice Coach, a diversity, equity, and inclusion and executive coaching firm. Her mantra is voice, power, confidence. As an emotional intelligence coach, she changes the way leaders and their organizations engage their employees and clients. Simone is an accomplished business strategist 
with a career in marketing, medical affairs, and global strategy roles at Fortune 500 pharmaceutical companies. She's been a featured thought leader in articles for Huffington Post, Forbes, and Pharmacy Times. Simone holds a BS in pharmacy and an MBA from Howard University. Troy Blackwell is the founder and CEO of Ready for Change, a political action committee dedicated to get out the vote activities. Troy has expertise in media, public affairs, and public relations, and has led communication programs in former roles at New York City-based agencies. Troy worked for now president, Vice President Kamala Harris for three years and previously held roles in the New York City Council. He was recognized by Cranes New York as a notable LGBTQ executive and was honored by PR Week as their 2020 most purposeful person under 30. Kelly Fuller is a DEI and communications consultant for Your Choice Coach an executive coaching and diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory firm. Kelly is passionate about addressing inequity and driving adoption for change, management, and in the workplace. As a consultant, she develops people-centered strategies for clients that support a more inclusive mindset and organizational culture. Kelly serves on the advisory council for the Diversity Action Alliance, a cross-industry coalition dedicated to increasing recruitment, retention, and representation in management for people of color and other underrepresented groups in the communications field. Welcome all. Uh, so great to have you all here. And we have a number of questions uh, I'm going to be posing to each of you. And then if there's time after, we'll have some cross discussion. So my first question is for you, Kelly. Uh, what steps have you taken to become more self-aware of your own biases? And what have you learned that could possibly help others who are joining us here this evening? Yes, thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining and to Kelly and Aurora. Um, Kelly, I met Kelly and Aurora about two years ago and They've really had a huge impact on me and my journey, especially Kelly, her transparency and authenticity in her journey and sharing mistakes and, and you know, key issues along the way that she's had to face and address. And I think having these discussions and for white people to hear others really coming forward and saying, you know, we, we can't be afraid to, to say the wrong thing. We have to put our, uh, this is an all hands on deck approach. Um, so I wanted to cover a few things. First off, I also struggle with the term ally. Uh, it often comes with platitudes, misperceptions, inaction. Being an ally is not a badge of honor, as Kimberly John Morgan often writes about, who I see is here today, um, when she shares stories about performative allyship. So what we're seeing a lot of is, you know, I'm a self-appointed ally. I'm the chair of our ZEI committee. I lead our women's employee resource group when the reality is there's no advocacy for BIPOC women in that. Um, and for me personally, as a cisgender woman who has benefited from white privilege, my title is a DEI consultant. So I need to build trust and credibility with the communities I support. It's not a given based on my title that I'm here to undo harm and nor would I expect otherwise. So to truly be anti-racist, we have to acknowledge that change begins first with self-reflection. We must understand and address our own biases. This includes getting comfortable with accepting the fact that bias is inherent in all of us, even when we have the best of intentions. So we need to move past this mindset that racism is only associated with overt intentional behaviors Allyship includes the deliberate practice of unlearning racism and shifting your mindset to practice new behaviors. So if we aren't holding ourselves accountable to action, we are a part of the problem with maintaining the status quo, and we need to be a part of the solution, as Kelly was discussing earlier. So to provide some context about my life journey, I grew up, I embraced diversity from a very young age. I, I've developed lifelong friendships um, with my best friends who are from diverse 
cultural backgrounds. Um, speaking up about systemic oppression and racism has always been a part of my journey. Um, but a real moment of reckoning for me was when I realized that because I felt my cultural competency was on a level well beyond that of my peers, that I developed this, I'm not one of those racist attitudes. And the problem with that mindset is that it feels, it, it feeds complacency and inaction, right? So acknowledging racism exists is not enough. Um, having friends from diverse backgrounds does not preclude us from bias. And it's something that I still need to check myself on as I continue to evolve. So there are a number of factors that have contributed to my journey. Um, you know, DEI certification from E. Cornell, which is where I learned about culting, cultivating an environment of psychological safety, um, deep one-on-one -on -one self awareness of work with my mentor and coach Simone. Um, you know, I've taken an intercultural development assessment, but with all the webinars I can join, all the reading, I'll say most importantly, when you have people in your life that you care for deeply, this really makes you want to do better. So I encourage everyone to just really try to get out of our bubbles and truly get to know people from all walks of life. Because when you have that connection and that care and love for someone, that's when you really want to step up to the plate and take action. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to our second question. And this is for Simone and Troy, if you could answer in that order. Simone first, then Troy. So uh, Simone and Troy, um, DEI discussions require an understanding that we need to get comfortable being uncomfortable to engage in hard conversations. So from your perspective, can you share your advice for the people who are listening, and especially for our white audience, um, in approaching these challenging conversations? Simone? Sure, thank you so much um, for having me. Listen, you're talking cult cancel culture to begin with, right? We'll have anyone fearful of saying the wrong thing, but this is not the, really the time to hold back. And I say that because there's so many opportunities um, in those personal spaces, professional spaces to speak up and speak out. But we have to have courage, right, as part of this equation. And I say that because we hear things that are just not cool. But when there is silence, what you're saying to that space is, it is cool. And so really thinking about how do we want to enroll people who enter our spaces, meaning the spaces in which you inhabit, right? Um, in terms of how to behave, communicate and interact. And these become really important because when, you're say, when you hear something that's not cool, say that's not cool because now you're alerting people to how they should be communicating, what they should be saying in your presence and when they're around you. Troy. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, first, I want to thank Kelly Fuller for organizing this. And also, I'm happy to be here with you, Lynn. Uh, many know that you were my academic advisor in undergrad, so it's good to see you again. The way that I answer this is that I really want people to look at DEI as being a business objective and not a humanitarian effort. I feel too often when I'm talking to people, people look at DE DEI as a humanitarian issue. They look at it as if they feel that they are doing marginalized people, people of color, a favor by giving them an opportunity or, or hiring when really I look at it as a business objective. Um, I was reading Business Insider and they actually talked about the economic impact of, of different groups, right? I believe it was 1.4 trillion for, for Black Americans, 1.5 for Latinos, um, and a list of growing others. And I kept thinking to myself, how come it is that we are living in New York, well, for, for myself, because I know that there's views from other places, but New York City is the largest media market in the United States. We're also one of the most diverse cities in North America. There's over a hundred languages spoken here every day. How come we are struggling with DEI? I, 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 that's something that I, that I find a really hard time grappling with. And so my way of encouraging people to go about these conversations is to kind of remo remove themselves from this humanitarian perspective. Look at it as a conversation related to the good of the business in itself. Thank you, Troy. Uh, we're gonna move on and then we can always come back to some of the specifics uh, afterwards. 
uh, because you both raised really important points. My next question is for Simone and Kelly in that order. Uh, so many people acknowledge that, acknowledge that racism exists, but may not know how to take constructive action to counter it when they see it. So can you talk a little bit about how we can all tap into our own emotional intelligence to be more proactive with our support and our commitment to help counter racism? Simone? Sure. Um, the, one, the, the qualities and traits that come to my mind really are around curiosity, empathy, and resiliency. And I'll say around with the curiosity piece is really the question I have is, are we willing to put that mirror up in front of us, right? And it can be hard for some of us because to, to do that, right? Because what we're saying is we're gonna look at our vulnerabilities. We're gonna look at the gaps. We're gonna look at things we don't know. And we're also going to be probing around what questions are we afraid to ask or to have answered as part of this self-reflection. As you continue on this journey of self-reflection and awareness and really understanding who you are and who you really want to be in this journey, the empathy piece comes into play. And I take that from Daniel Goleman, reach forward, focus on others. And with that comes the understanding and connection where the really, do we understand others' perspectives, but what voices are you listening to? Do you understand what others feel? But do you really, are you checking in to understand the challenges that others are experiencing? And the ability to sense what others need from you. What are you willing to do? What risks are you willing to take? What questions are you willing to ask in a meaningful way to lean in? And that also builds into the resiliency piece, right? That courage part, because you are going to hear things like, well, you're not, and you can fill in the blank, you're not that type of person, why do you care? And that's where it really becomes important to dig deeper in and find that voice and tell people what you believe and why you believe it matters and you should care. Thank you. Yeah, so just going into, um, you know, Simone's point on empathy, you know, we don't go, I don't go through these lived experiences, right? So in people in the workplace, what we're seeing is like this huge disconnect between what the lived experiences of black and brown um, employees versus what white leadership thinks it to be because everyone gets along and smiles when they walk in the office, right? And so having this empathy to understand what the root causes of these issues are of the in inequities in the office, um, you know, really, that's what leads to the genuine, authentic approach to DEI, because what we're seeing is a huge issue with people, um, it, they're handling it all the wrong ways because they just lack empathy and they don't understand and they're just not committed to it. Um, so I think, again, then leading into self-awareness, you know, the heart of the heart of strong leadership is on people who are self-aware, right? And that's what all of this is about. Again, I could say I'm an ally and I can, I will still make a mistake and, it, and I have to be ready and resilient to own up to that mistake. And I have to self-identify when I've said things and I've done this before where I've said, I think maybe when I said that I was white centering myself and, you know, I'll talk it out with somebody. Um, but, you know, just being genuine and authentic, you need the empathy, you need the self-awareness, you need um, the social skills. We find often that you know, we know in companies, they think like, let's all go golfing or have happy hour. And that's going to make us all best friends and, you know, get along in the office. You need to understand that doesn't work for everybody. So we can't have this cookie cutter approach. So I think leading from self-awareness, self-regulation, um, empathy, and some of those social skills will really allow people to, um, you know, be genuine in their approach and and be open when they've missed the mark and make mistakes, which is really important for that accountability factor. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, my next question is for Troy. Troy, uh, what are some of the ways that individuals from diverse backgrounds can, can strongly and effectively advocate for themselves in the workplace? Thank you. 
I think the, the best way to go about advocating for yourself in the workplace is through employee resource groups or with other employees. And the reason I say that is because many people will probably understand what I'm talking about when I mention this. If you are one person and you're advocating for yourself and you're speaking up about an issue, it's very easy for people to point the finger and say, this one person is a problem. This person is difficult. And that often happens to people of color. It happens to myself, I know many people that it has happened to, but if you are in a workplace and you are speaking up on an issue and you need help advocating for yourself, I say employee resource groups, diversity committees, because when you are stronger in numbers, right? It's like if you have one pencil and you try to break it, you'll break it. But if you take a, a stack of pencils, you have 20 pencils, it's gonna be harder to break. And I think it shows that, okay, it's not just one individual person's experience, it's a collective, right? And everyone's experience may be a little bit different, but I do think we are stronger in numbers and it's a little bit undervalued. And I think that's a really important thing that we don't normally discuss as finding safety in those employee resource groups. Uh, often there are individuals, this is, I'm just throwing this out to you, who may be the sole person of color in their workplace. Uh, yeah. Any ideas on how they can build a yeah. collective to, to help support them? Yeah, something that I try to do is, uh, again, it's about finding people that you connect to on different levels, people that, that you can trust and have open discussions with. For some people that takes a little bit longer of a time, something that I try to do in, in my personal life, I know it's a little bit harder in a workplace, especially if you are uh, one of the only in a, in a setting, but I like to think of this mindset of building a personal board of directors for yourself, people who can advocate for you, people who can speak up for you, if that's building a really good relationship with a particular uh, manager or direct supervisor, I think those are all key areas that can help you in terms of advocating in the workplace. It's going to be difficult. I think many people are intimidated. I've been intimidated to advocate for myself in the workplace, but it is something that needs to be done. Um, and so again, I think it's about finding those people that you trust and have genuine connections with, that that's the best advice that I can give in those individual scenarios. Great, thank you so much to you, to you both. Uh, we're moving on to a question for Kelly and Simone now. Uh, what kinds of skills should leaders, should leaders embrace that genuinely demonstrate support, value, and affirmation of their team members and those who report to them? And the second part of this question is, can you talk a little bit about the types of behaviors that undermine achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion or that might be inadvertently destructive. Kelly? Sure. Sorry, one second. I just closed out the screen by accident. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of a lot of skill sets that need to be further developed from what we're hearing out there, right? I mean, we are really in a state of emergency in the workplace. We are hearing stories left and right about um, lack of inclusive leadership skills and behaviors that are happening. And I think we really need to realize that this is no longer gonna fly in the office. It never should have, right? But we know that Gen Z and the millennials are really looking for different, um, speaking up when it comes to these things, especially Gen Z, there's gonna be no tolerance. And so what we need to take a look at is we have to constantly give affirmation to our employees um, we need to communicate well, which sounds crazy, right? We're communicators. People are not communicating well. And I will tell you one example. So what we're hearing that's happening a lot in the agency space, um, and I'm sure it's happening at a corporate level as well, is that when um, BIPOC interns and recent graduates are advocating for themselves, um, whether they're in an internship and they're asking about negotiating salary just for tips, or it's an intern that's getting offered a role, we're hearing people get very defensive and, and when, they are, when they're asking questions about negotiating and advocating for themselves, we're hearing a lot of leaders saying, well, what do you mean? You should be lucky if you get offered a role here or, you know, our offer is final. You know, that's basically what's being communicated. 
And at the end of the day, if an agency has taken steps for salary equality to set, you know, the bar, so when everyone comes in, they have the same salary, you need to communicate that in a proper way. You need to still um, empower your, your interns to want to negotiate, right? If we're all in this to, to level the playing field and for people to get paid well, be supported, um, and, and do this, you need to have the skill sets to be able to have these conversations, right? In addition to you need to have leadership that's diverse because clearly we're still seeing that this is not the case. Um, so I'd say when it comes to, you know, you need to be able to share your vision about DEI, it needs to be um, communicated from the top down. Um, and I think focusing on practicing inclusive meetings, um, being fair in your um, performance reviews and identifying inequities in those, all of those things I think will be helpful. Thank you, Kelly. Simone, would you like to address this? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think of Simon Sinek when he says leadership is a lifestyle, right? It's not just when you're in the office and you have a title and things are great. It's also looking at how do you lead not only professionally, but also personally in your personal spaces because they, they are intertwined and we're living in worlds where they are mixed together and jumbled. And so, you know, thinking of a, a, some questions I was asking um, and had conversation with the CIO, and it was around diversity, equity, inclusion. He said, Simone, what you're asking is, am I a good human, right? And so when we think about that question, he's like, you know, if, if I'm not a good human, then why am, I not, why am I here, right? And so when you think about these inclusive behaviors and what we're really trying to do, and I think Troy alluded to the fact that it's a business objective, think about though those conversations that you're having. Take the ego out of those conversations because it's not about you. Right. These folk, these conversations should be focused on human beings. And what are you willing to do to treat humans like human beings where they feel respected, where they feel valued? Right. We know that we have our deep seated values. We have our beliefs. Yes. And you have your personalities that are all intertwined in who you are. But also think too, if you're on this journey and doing that self reflection and self awareness. What are the behaviors that you're willing to take a look at, to pivot, to just adjust? Because it's just a micro change that has the hugest impact, right? And so, but it's understanding how you are interacting, collaborating, building those, that trust, the connections. We are social beings. So in terms of that perspective, really looking at what are our intentions, what's your impact, and how are you treating humans like human beings? Thank you very much. Uh, Troy, uh, this question is for you. Um, our industry is heavily reliant on team building and we hold a lot of meetings in the communications business. How can team leaders and staff look beyond just the meeting agenda to ensure that everyone is engaged and feels safe to contribute to the discussion? Or as I see Shelly Spector is already asking, what are some of the best practices for inclusive meetings? Yeah, well, I think Simone alluded to this. We're working, we're human beings. Humans want to know that, that other people know that they exist. So I think when you have these meetings, it's really important to, to ask people, how are they doing? Just ask the human level questions. I think that kind of lightens the mood when you go into meetings. A lot of meetings I've joined have been really stuffy and uptight and it feels very robotic at times. And so it just kind of feels like you're in a stuffy environment. But I think asking how people are doing, how their family are doing, specifically in the times that we are in, since everything is virtual, I do think that that goes a long way, but also something that I use as a best practice, and, and I learned um, a couple of years ago when I was an intern um, in the White House, I remember in the Office of Public Engagement, all the staff and interns would have weekly meetings, and Valerie Jarrett, who was then President Obama's senior advisor, would always be in these weekly meetings. And everyone gets super intimidated because Valerie Jarrett was coming in the room and she was sitting down and nobody wanted to like ask the wrong question or say the wrong thing. And she had this method where it was, it was 
put out there, no matter if you are the most senior person or the most junior person in the room, everyone's perspective matters. So in those weekly meetings, she made it a priority to call on everyone. And so everyone got into the habit of these meetings, coming prepared and giving everyone an opportunity to speak. Sometimes we, you know, we'll join meetings and there's always that one person who goes on and on and on. Um, sometimes there are big personalities and it's easy to get intimidated, especially if you are in a junior position. But I, I appreciated the, 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 the method in which Valerie used because it made me feel seen at that time as an intern. And I've always used it as a best practice and I feel it works. And sometimes that's how you get your best ideas is the person with the best idea can be really quiet just because of the fact that they're intimidated by the aura of the room. But if, if the leader in the room, the person who's conducting says, hey, I wanna hear from everyone, including you, and you have that opportunity, that spotlight on you, I think it's a really uh, good way for people to get into a habit. And it also made everyone make sure they were prepared just in case. So what you're saying, Troy, is it's really up to the leader of the meeting to be the one who's responsible um, for being inclusive of everybody in the meeting, right? It's not just us to, up to just raise our hands, but it's up to the leader to create an environment that invites people to contribute. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, my next question is for Simone, Troy, and Kelly uh, in that order. Uh, a number of organizations have made strides with recruiting and hiring diverse candidates, but they fall short on transparency with retention and promotion rates. So many lack diverse representation in leadership as well. So what can organizations do to gain a competitive edge and to embrace a culturally competent work environment. Simone, would you like to start? Oh, sure. Um, I think about, you know, what's the game that's being played here, right? And I say that because from my lens, we're really talking about how do we unearth innovation and creativity, right? And right now within where we are in organizations and how they exist, it's more than just being a competitive and using your marketing voice. It's really talking about too, there is a demographic shift that's taking place, whether we like it or not, it's happening without us or with us. Gender inequality, that is a global issue that continues and it's real. The next set of leaders, those Gen Zs who are ready to be groomed and to be treated and, and have expectations of what a workplace is supposed to be like. And then also within all this bubble is, is diversity, equity, inclusion surrounding and having the conversations, right? So this game that we're playing, it's not an either or game, it's an and game. And it's an and game because we're looking at it from a long-term strategy, right? To tackle the issues of being competitive and thriving. And if what we're doing in terms of this game is that you need to create a playbook. And that playbook is where you start with your vision for what does an inclusive culture look like? What is it gonna be feeling, doing? What are people saying and hearing about this? Within that place also, what's the plan? Yeah, you have a vision, but then what's the plan to support this and to, to get it going? But also, what are some metrics that we wanna utilize around grooming? There has to be mentorship, there has to be coaching, right? We, you ha you're teaching, you can't hoard all information by yourself and weaponize it, you have to share it. That's how the creativity comes in. That's how the psychological safety comes in also. So, and then there are the ideas, others' perspectives. If you have the same people talking the same thing, you're gonna get the same outputs. Get different people talking about different things, you'll get different outputs. And that's what keeps it moving and that's what keeps evolving and that's what keeps us relevant. Thanks. Thank you, Simone. Troy? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this, about how to retain people right to retain diverse employment and i think uh there was a quote out there that says what gets measured gets managed right and i think that's really important when it comes to the metrics of diverse talent seeing the numbers that we're bringing in and seeing how people are, are 
elevating within agencies or in-house, I do think that information is important. I do encourage people who are working on DEI to, to think about that. We need to see those metrics. Those metrics are imperative because that's how we can manage our success. But I think also in order to retain talent, I think it's about establishing internal mentorship programs, finding senior leaders who can take on uh, mentees at, at the junior level. Uh, I think of also some best practices for those who work in HR, things like blind recruitment, right? Um, being able to give a particular amount of funding to employee resource groups to invite speakers and to have conversations like what we are having now. I think these are all things that uh, employees are looking for. They're looking for the professional development. They're looking for an opportunity for growth. And I think when you provide the employees with that, it will retain them in itself. Thank you. Kelly? Yeah, so some really good points made. Um, I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, we need to under, companies need to understand that DEI has to be embedded into an organization's core values and culture. Um, it is not a siloed approach to, um, you know, the work environment. And so really having a, a strong vision, mission, statement, um, and strategy is crucial here, right? not just doing these one-off events, um, even having the ERGs, they're not there to, they're there to give the guidance. They're not paid resources. Sometimes they're paid, but they're not the DEI departments, right? And so what's really important, I think, for companies is once they have the strategy in place is having this reporting transparency, which we're really not seeing enough of. And I don't mean just sharing data on group diversity numbers. I mean, I want to see the promotion rates, I want to see the retention rates, I want to see the data. And, I, and if you are sharing that data, then you're holding yourself accountable. Um, I want to see what's, you know, how leadership is being held accountable. Um, and we have some seen some reports of companies that are working on this um, that we kind of look to as best practice. But I think one of the huge biggest disconnects that I see when it comes to companies with their DEI efforts is they're going off of one employee engagement survey or a DEI survey, um, but they haven't had focus groups with, with uh, um, different groups within their organization in a safe space for people to share feedback sans fragility. Um, and that's really where you get those anecdotal stories and experiences from people where they feel comfortable to share in an anonymous way um, what they're going through and what that experience is like. And that's crucial for developing your strategy, along with looking at the policies and procedures and identifying the inequities within those, right? So it's all part of the strategy. So once you have the strategy, then you really need to be measuring it and you need to be communicating this, not with just your employees who also need to be a part of this journey um, and feel that they are a part of it, but also publicly, um, and there just needs to be more transparency. And I think the companies that are doing this well and sharing that information, those are the companies that are gonna do a great job with recruiting talent, with hiring and with retaining employees. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Kelly and Troy, one last question for you before we close out. Uh, can you kind of dig a little bit deeper to, to talk about what, we as employees can do to become more aware of the disparities in our own workplace um, that we may not be aware of, that we maybe never put on our radar, and what are some of the tangible steps that we ourselves can take to help counter these inequities? Uh, Kelly, then Troy. Sure. So this is an area that once I opened my eyes and started seeing it, you can't unsee it, right? So we have to all start paying closer attention to these things, right? So aside, in addition to who has a voice in decision making, who has a seat at the table, um, you know, Joe Cardillo, he speaks very often on power. The people who have power really need to share the power. They need to bring people into the dialogue, bring people into the room. And this is all collectively a part of our responsibility, right? Um, so paying attention to who's being recruited, who's being hired, who's being retained, who's being fired, who is resigning, start paying close attention to these things because what we're seeing happen, and as many of you know, is that companies are sharing their data 
and they're not transparent that five folks just quit last month and they just replaced them with five more. So if we're not fixing the issues that the current workforce has, they're gonna continue on and there's gonna be no accountability. I mean, how can you have an environment of inclusivity if you don't know what the current issues are and you're not tackling them and transparent about that? So really pay attention to these things. Another point I wanna make, and I cannot express enough to you how often this happens. Oftentimes the narrative of why someone has departed an organization is led by their direct manager or there's just, let's say a rumor, right? Oftentimes that information is, is inaccurate. And let's just remember that, you know, I've seen people come into a company full of excitement they're contributing, they're adding value, they're part of feeling a part of the team. And after getting shut down time and time again and reporting into a toxic manager, they end up leaving. Then you see them go somewhere else and they're, they're feeling supported, they're feeling empowered, they have a voice in decision-making and all of a sudden, and then they're flourishing, right? And so I'm sure we all have experiences where we've seen people in those situations. So really start watching how the, watch how the narrative is developed and create your own, um, reasoning behind it and ask questions, become curious. And what we all need to start doing now is when, if someone's interviewing for a company, we as white people need to start asking the tough DEI questions. This is not just supposed to be people of color. People are going through lived experiences. This has to be something that we are pushing for and we are not asking vague questions. I wanna know what, what is your um, transparency report? Can I see it? Um, you know, what are you changing? And we got to ask these very targeted questions in the interviews because collectively we all need to start speaking up on that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Kelly. Uh, Troy, would you like to respond? Yeah, I think it all starts by having conversations, having conversations with your, with your colleagues, those who you are, are close with. I think dialogue is super important. That's the number one human connection is talking. And I feel like that's how we learn about the issues that are impacting people the most. There are certain issues that are affecting other groups of people um, that I don't necessarily experience or I don't experience normally, right? So I think having that dialogue and, and just having the willingness to, to not only share, but the willingness to listen to other people. I think that's what makes us aware of what's happening in the workplace. Uh, I can think of a few situations, but I think something that's really important to me is, is pay equity, right? There's a lot of times where employees of color um, who have similar or same amount of experience or roles maybe are not making the same as people, uh, some as their colleagues in similar roles. I've seen that there are a lot of um, uh, diverse professionals who have started to create uh, Excel sheets. I've seen them floating around a couple of times on LinkedIn where people are sharing their, their title and position at certain agencies, letting people know what um, uh, an account director or a VP makes in a at a certain agency um, who's of a particular race or gender. I think looking at things like that are really important. Um, something that I would also say is set timelines and goals, right? I know I talk a lot about the uh, about the good use of employee uh, resource groups, but if you are advocating for something and you want to see something uh, change, one thing that I always tell people is make sure that you also have solutions. When you are pointing out the problem, a lot of the times, the person you're pointing out the problem to will say, well, what exactly do you want me to do about X, Y, Z? So I think it's really important when we are addressing these issues and we're saying, hey, we want to see XYZ changed, make sure that you are also presenting solutions um, and some timelines. That way you can measure. Again, what gets measured can get managed. That's great. We have a minute. I'm just going to ask you, Simone, do you want to add anything to this, to this question at all? Additional thoughts? My last, just last tidbits, I would say, thanks for asking that question, is think about your day-to-day -day interactions with people, right? Because that people think that, oh, if we do great things and we have all these metrics and, and, think, and that's great, but the day-to-days are what really matters um, to it to everyone and how you communicate, how you delegate, how you can collaborate, how you share information. It's the little things that have the biggest impact. Thank you. So I hear that as get out of your own lane. <laughs> That's my interpretation. <laughs> thank you all. So thank you, Simone, Troy, and Kelly for your insights and for these amazing and important takeaways um, and action ideas. 
So um, I'm going to invite you to turn off your cameras and mics um, until the Q and A. Um, thank you all. And now we're going to move to our second panel of esteemed guests, and they will be addressing the following. Um, we'll be talking about factors to consider when well-intentioned DEI programs miss the mark and negatively impact employee engagement in mental health, how organizations can gain a competitive stance for recruitment, hiring, retention, and advancement of systematically excluded communities, and we'll also discuss success factors that should be considered by organizations for cross-mentoring, internships, and bringing on new hires, as well as retention, in alignment with Gen Z expectations. And so our next panel, panel two, please turn on your cameras and your, your mics. And I would like to in introduce you all, and that th these are Katie Mooney, Pat Ford, Jordan Williams, and Madeline de los Santos, and uh, welcome all. And I'm just going to introduce each of you briefly before we get into our Q&A. So Katie Mooney is Vice President of Saramount and is an accomplished DE&I leader and thought partner with expertise in driving strategy and growth of diversity and inclusion change management, planning, and programs. As Vice President and Head of Diversity Best Practices at Ciramount, Katie is a trusted advisor to 300 plus member companies, providing them with practitioner expertise, best in class solutions, tools and resources, and identifying opportunities to take member strategies, systems and processes and programs to the next level. Pat Ford, is a professional in residence at the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications. Pat joined UF from Burson Marsteller, where he served in a variety of senior executive roles for over 28 years, most recently as vice chair for client services. He specializes in corporate reputation management and issues and crisis management. Pat is a board member and immediate past chair of the Diversity Action Alliance and serves on the boards of the Institute of Public Relations, the Planck Center for Leadership in Public Relations, and the Museum of Public Relations. And he's also a former board member of the LeGrant Foundation. Jordan Williams is a business leader and program associate in Chicago for LinkedIn. Jordan is a recent graduate from Boston University who is passionate about community. He's focused his time both in Boston and Atlanta by bringing people together through various ways. Currently, Jordan is a talent acquisition specialist at LinkedIn through its highly sought out business leadership program. And he recently earned early placement into his new role as enterprise sales consultant. Madeline de los Santos is a senior at the City College of New York, majoring in public relations and advertising. Madeline is president of CCNY's PRSSA chapter, where she creates industry-wide events that provide multicultural students with the tools and networking skills that they need in their emerging communication careers. She was recently honored as the 2021 Art Stevens PRSA New York CCNY Scholar for Excellence in Public Relations. Welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. Uh, so everybody, my, my first question is for the entire panel. Uh, we'll take it in the order of Katie, Pat, Jordan, Madeline, and my question is, what are, do you see as some of the key barriers to existing DEI programs that may be well-intentioned, but are really ineffective? And so Katie, let's start with you. 
Great. Well, thanks so much, Lynn, for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So as it relates to the barriers, I'm actually going to start by perhaps sharing the barriers for well-intentioned DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices, um, that then, of course, create the DEI programs led by perhaps the chief diversity officer or a head of diversity and inclusion and others, and let my fellow panelists perhaps talk to you a little bit more about the programming. Because I want to share probably the first challenge I see with well-intentioned DEI offices and the strategic efforts really result from a lack of support or resources. We actually find through our index benchmarking at Saramount that out of the 193 organizations that participate each year on our index, of the organizations that have made the best practices threshold, unfortunately, the position or the designated individual responsible for DEI reports to the CEO, 1% of them do, quite frankly. And the good news here, though, is that 78% do show or report into as the lead role, they report into a corporate executive. So that is the good news. And while 64% of our index participants and our index companies have shown an increase in the size of their DEI teams, we know that 2020, 2021 have propelled efforts forward significantly. And what I find often is that in smaller organizations, there's either a head of role, this is someone who perhaps has a shared role, their current role and responsibility of DEI is shared with another business function. So we're often seeing someone being the head of HR and the chief diversity officer. And or we see the head of role is a role of one person. So this person serves as the program manager, the administrator, the trainer, the strategist. Like, how is that sustainable? So while it's applause worthy to have seen these roles be created, it's really difficult for me to think that well-intentioned programs that meet the mark can really be done when you've got staffing based off limited resources. And of course, and at the end result truly will be programmatic elements that are just limited. Secondly, the other part after talking with fellow heads of DEI is that there's actually this real lack of buy-in and adoption of DEI from the top. And in fact, we did a research report called Pledge from Pledge to Progress, where we really wanted to look at the state of corporate America one year after the murder of George Floyd. And as we saw pledges, financial contribution statements to really promote anti-racism, for example, our findings revealed that 95% of executives said they are committed to helping their companies fight racism. However, they feel three quarters find that diversity and inclusion efforts are overblown. Three quarters of them believe that diversity and inclusion efforts are overblown. And this is sad as we showcase not only these barriers that we have where, again, there is a single sole person doing diversity and inclusion work, but also the lack of support from the leaders. And you know, this is really difficult for us because when I think about my fellow kind of colleagues who are chief diversity officers, I think about how the negative impacts of these programs, then how do they actually impact the chief diversity officer? Perhaps this person of one, likely maybe and probably someone who is a person of color carrying that unnecessary weight on their shoulders and without their buy-in from senior leaders, those folks that believe DNI is overblown, perhaps the feeling of being tokenized in this DEI leadership role, this is really catastrophic, quite frankly, for DEI leadership. And we find that in a Russell Reynolds report in September 2021, uh, this year, they showcase that the average tenure of a CDO or a chief diversity officer in corporate America went from 3.1 years in 2018 to now 1.8 years of service. 
So when we see that fluidity, even as it comes to chief diversity officer roles, we then have to ask ourselves, how are we setting up our DEI offices for success? Thank you, Katie. Uh, Pat, would you like to add to the conversation? Yes, I think, first of all, one of the most important steps that really has not been fully embraced in many situations is the need to recognize the business imperative underlying the, uh, the need for more diversity, equity, inclusion. And in, in, if we really address it, and, and Troy uh, alluded to this in the earlier panel, as a business uh, imperative and not as a humanitarian program, uh, then we start looking at it in a more systematic way. And we stop thinking about it in terms of how do we make some marginal changes here or there to rather be thinking of it as a transformational exercise that most companies need to go through and still need to go through in terms of changing how we evaluate talent, how we, how we cultivate talent, how we build and build more uh, radical empathy into our systems and how we listen to our stakeholders and listen to our employees in a more meaningful way. And I think in, as we start to do that, most successful companies know how to solve critical business imperatives. Uh, and I think the more we can move ourselves to, to resolve that we're gonna take this action, we're gonna move from intentions to action, then we're also gonna uh, be more inclined to adopt what Don Thompson, the former CEO of McDonald's described as institutionalizing the intentionality, taking those good intentions and turning them into concrete, specific action that we can measure and build on for all of our stakeholders internally and externally. Thank you, Pat. Jordan? Yeah, I think Katie and Pat have brought in two really good points. I think that as a recent college grad, I can understand this. Our diversity leader um, at Boston University, we've had quick turnover because you feel alone in that role. Um, it's really easy to be the only person advocating for someone and to feel like you're a one-man army or one-woman army. I think it's really important to understand that you shouldn't make people feel so special, but more so make them feel included into the conversation. We're not asking for a special treatment, we're asking to be included. And I think that's the real importance of having diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, conversations. Because if you're not doing that, what are you really creating? Also going back to what Pat said about what Troy said earlier, as far as it being an actual part of the business and not a humanitarian effort. White guilt is not going to solve a systematic problem. Actually addressing the system in place that is going to uh, help individuals that have been marginalized within that system is the only way to resolve it. So it's that, that is the important portion. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Madeline? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, some of the DEI programs on, in companies that are maybe well-intentioned, they're just straight up ignorant because they, these programs are developed to put a check, a check on the CSR box, the corporate social responsibility box. And the challenge that they miss is to try and figure out what the problem is. And instead they end up doing, they end up doing the, um, the you know, they end up doing um, um, what they think they want to solve the problem. And C-level and HR managers need to start looking at this as a growth opportunity and give their program and the BIPOC employees the same energy and attention that they give to their clients. Because at the end of the day, the employees are the ones that define um, the business and POC employees aren't, if they aren't respected or listened to, then that says a lot about the organization. So what we need from the workplace is a change in mindset of reinvention and growth by positioning DEI in the center and DNA of the organizations. As communications professionals, one of the things that we do is build brands from the ground and up. And all that we are asking for is an effective DEI pro um, program that is not rocket science, that is not rocket science, and it shouldn't be a problem for it to be effective and take this long to be um, implemented into our culture. Thank you so much there to take in. Bravo for all of you and your contributions. Um, so Katie, 
Uh, the, the Saramount Diversity and Inclusion Index is considered to be the gold standard of measurement and reporting in this area. Can you talk a little bit about why this is important and briefly tell us um, how people can access this information? Sure. Well, the Saramount Inclusion Index is open to any organization with 500 employees or more. And it is a probably, I think, 400 question benchmark to really promote and drive internal change, looking at things from uh, best practices and recruitment, retention and advancement of people from historically underrepresented groups, inclusive corporate culture, leadership accountability, and demographic diversity for women and racial and ethnic minorities. We really took this year to take a look at current social climate to say, how are organizations addressing racism? How are we thinking about promotion levels for women and racial um, and ethnic groups within an organization at different job levels. We also were very mindful about supplier diversity and the importance um, as our small businesses and our communities have been globally impacted by, of course, COVID-19. And we also run a global index that looks at 15 countries across four regions for uh, truly the best practices in information. And um, so again, all can participate at the three month window. And I just wanna share two real kind of key features or kind of findings we found from our 2021 index. First, the recruitment, retention and advancement, 81% of our index companies now require diverse interview slate compared with 45% in 2020. Regarding accountability, 94% hold managers accountable for DEI during performance reviews. And in fact, 57% of our inclusion index companies compensate managers for DEI results compared with 42% a year prior. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Madeline and Jordan, uh, can you talk a little bit about the types of information that you look for um, in assessing if a company is being transparent and genuine with its DEI statements and commitments. Madeline first. Yeah, um, the first thing that I do is research their website. I look at their employees, their teams, if their teams are mainly white and are working on POC campaigns, then that is a major red flag. There, that should be like the main issue. And in regards to, to their DEI statements, um, to make sure that, that it's not all fluff and that they're not trying to fill a status quo, we have to question ourselves um, whether they have done an internal company campaign that voices the support of POC and DEI. Are their ideas outdated and are they relevant with what's really going on in today's world? And are they involved in the conversation? Like, what are they doing to support POC, not only in the workplace, but outside of the workplace as well? And one of the things that we look for as well is progress. We don't expect these companies to change overnight, but we want to see progress and that you're involved and in trying out there and listening to us as well. Thank you. Jordan? Yes, I think this is kind of a question I was actually speaking with my girlfriend about as we were talking about interviewing and just like being interviewed as well. What is, is the importance of asking the question of what does diversity and inclusion look like? As a talent acquisition specialist right now, one thing that I, you know, make sure to include in the conversation, you know, DNI is important to LinkedIn. I sometimes when I was being interviewed and I was interviewing for LinkedIn, I asked them, what does diversity and inclusion look like? If the question, if the answer is not good for you, then you're not right for that company. The same time you're putting yourself up to uh, for, for stake in that company, they're putting up the, themselves at stake for you. So if they can answer simple questions about how you can feel included in the workplace at an interview, they're not gonna make you feel included when you're actually there. It's going to be tokenism, it's gonna, make, it's gonna be disingenuous. I think one real thing that we should focus on anytime when talking about real DNI is being authentic. I think one place that really does it well is Target. Um, when I interviewed for them, they all had the saying, like bring your authentic self to work. I, I embody that, they embody that during my conversation with them. Also just talking with employees there, LinkedIn is a beautiful tool. Um, you can connect with anybody, have conversations, see what it's like to be actually an employee there. Um, by doing so, you can kind of get your own like uh, climate, uh, climate survey about how the company's doing, what steps can you take? 
Um, do you want to be the champion of diversity? Do you want to be the only Black person or, or Latinx person or LGBTQ person in the room to handle those conversations when it gets to, hey, what does the Black experience look like, Jordan? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't want to be the person to always speak on it. So I think it's really important to ask those questions while you have the opportunity to. Great. Thank you both. A lot to think about. Uh, the next question is for Katie and Pat. Uh, what can employees do to constructively address workplace inequities that they experience? Katie? Yeah, so I think that rather than taking on this question as the maybe the victim of microaggressions, but many of them that I've faced that I can, more than I can count rather, I perhaps would I want to talk a little bit about privilege here and privilege perhaps through allyship and being an upstander for an employee in the workplace who has experienced a microaggression. Often, I think it's important to remember that these are the colleagues who often face marginalization, discrimination, and uh, these micro inequities actually have real risks involved for these people when speaking up, for our colleagues when speaking up, because oftentimes when I might advocate for myself as a woman of color, I might then be seen as someone who's difficult to work with. Or perhaps I'm often told to consider the good intentions of the aggressor, assume positive intent often comes up versus um, you know, the action that actually happened. And even worse at times, almost being gaslit to imagine that these offenses never happened at all. And so as I take into the context of perhaps showing up for others as an upstander, perhaps assessing my own privilege, utilizing my influence, maybe I'm in a moment um, where say I'm in a meeting and I hear a microaggression towards a colleague of mine. Oh, wow, you have a mental disability? You seem normal to me. And immediately I kind of revert to this model that's been really helpful to me, which is from the Tolerance Settle Center, the Tolerance Center called IQEE. -E. And it's I interrupt, Q question, E educate, and then E echo. So interrupt, I might say, excuse me, can I interject here? As an upstander, I can then question, what did you mean by that? Can you clarify what you just said? Or maybe in this example, can you define what normal means? And then I might educate, share from my own experience. Well, did you know that the National Alliance on Mental Health actually showcases that one in five of us have a mental illness and I'm in fact one of those people? Or I could echo, let's say I'm not ready to share, I'm not ready to educate, I'm not ready to tell someone about myself, but when I see someone else being an upstander, I can echo them, standing with them, affirming, joining someone when possible. And I think that those are really tangible ways to this, again, IQEE -E model that I use to be an upstander for someone that has experienced not only a microaggression, but isn't safe to speak out. Thank you, Katie. I'm gonna memorize that one. Um, Pat? Yes. Katie, that was great. Um, and let me, I've got a couple other points, but I want to just build on one thing she just made. Uh, the other point there is that just to feed back through a, through a, a question like, well, let me get this straight. Are you telling me, are you telling me that I should think this, or is this how the company believes this? I think in, in these areas, as in many in business, it's surprising how often you can make progress just by feeding back to someone what they're, you're hearing them say because very often that's not what they actually intended. Um, or even if it is, when they hear it coming back, they realize that's, in, that's not the proper, uh, that's not the company's uh, values. Uh, and, and that gets to another point, which is I think number one, um, find mentors and mentors can be, they don't have to be your boss. They don't have to be somebody's senior in the company. They could be, but uh, I've had a number of positions where my best mentor when I first got there was somebody that was several levels more junior than I, but just seemed to know how everything worked and, and where I could go and ask the pertinent and impertinent questions about what do they really mean by this or how should I interpret that? Uh, because sometimes you can really get a lot of help in navigating through a workplace, through colleagues at various levels. Second, um, 
there are uh, there are many ways that you can get engaged in ERGs. First of all, get engaged in ERGs in your in your company. If the company doesn't have them, propose starting them. It's amazing what you can get accomplished when there's a gap or a, a void, a vacuum somewhere, at whatever level you are, uh, by simply taking some initiative. And it's sometimes surprising how much people will let you do without even asking for permission. Um, but either way, uh, if, assuming there are, because many many companies have. Uh, good ERG programs, get involved in them, but get involved in them in a, in a resolute way that gets you an ability to, to engage with others that you can learn from and that you can also uh, maybe make some differences. Uh, and, uh, and finally, it, it's really important to, um, to be clear about your own sense of purpose. We all talk a lot these days. I teach a whole course about corporate purpose and, and how companies need to have be clear about their values and their mission and their purpose. But individuals working within those companies need to be clear about their purpose. So, so take some time. Uh, we have a wonderful professional in our field, Patrice Tanaka, who has started a whole business around helping people to, to understand their own purpose. Because once you do, it becomes a lot clearer what doesn't match up with that purpose. And, and it gives you maybe some more courage and willingness to take on uh, inequities because if they're going to just dismiss it, or worse, do some of what Katie was accurately describing happens, then my question would be, is that a place you want to work anyway? Right. There's, there's a war for talent out there, and you don't have to endure that. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, next question, Madeline, Jordan, and Katie. Can you... Uh, talk about how your workplace colleagues and your employer um, might be supportive in times of social injustice um, and specifically maybe talk about the concept of performative activism from your perspective. Yeah, um, one thing that I know is that I would feel safe if somebody can just lend an ear and listen to me. Um, it's important for a company to establish mental health check-in programs, um, whether it is the person, the person managing you or supervising you, or it's a person fully dedicated to hear your concerns and thoughts about the current political and social injustice issues going on in America or in the world. My take on performative activism is that it's a huge issue going on in the media and world right now. It's basically when you are supporting social and racial injustice issues um, just for the show and to get people to like you. And that is true for many influencers, companies, and organizations. For example, these performative activists are basically just trying to use it more as an Instagram and TikTok trend instead of focusing on people's actual lives. And a lot of them are receiving the attention when it should be towards the actual people who are putting their lives and creating awareness to these issues. And that is why putting education first is more important than putting performance first. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, Jordan? Yes, uh, I was waiting to, for this question, honestly. Uh, so important to me. Um, <laughs> I think one, I have a saying, um, it's kind of a saying that I had during 2020. Uh, civil rights is not a movement, it's a lifestyle that we all have to live by. When you put a movement, you put an end date on something. And I think that there's been a collective thing that we've all been saying throughout this time. It's a collective struggle for diversity and inclusion. There's never a right answer. There's never a right approach. It's a multifaceted approach that we all must tackle together. Um, as far as performative activism, performative activism is something that is like the hokey dokey. You're, 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 you're switching out on people and that's what causes people to leave. So kind of going back to, I think a question that was in here by uh, Shelly Spector. The reason why young people are leaving companies so fast is because we're not gonna put up with it. We're not, we, if we see it, we're gonna call it out. We're gonna tell you, hey, we're no longer gonna work for this company. Um, and that's one thing as a talent acquisition specialist at LinkedIn I've been seeing. A lot of people are leaving the companies they're at and coming to companies like LinkedIn because of culture and fit. They're coming because they want to be around somewhere that lives by what their creed is saying. They're, they're looking at our mission statement, our vision statement, our diversity inclusion statement saying, yo, these people are actually doing it. The company I was at made me feel belittled. When I tried to do what they told me to do, I was outcasted. 
I felt alone. I was the only one living by it. Also, another thing is, on going back to the first thing I mentioned is about, is a constant, it's a lifestyle for people that are marginalized. Understand that sometimes when creating those conversations as far as, are you okay? You know, checking in on people is so important, but in order to do so, you have to be actively a part of that community. It can't be one-off times. Thank you, Katie. I echo a lot of what Madeline and Jordan said, really, truly. Um, you know, I thought about in social injustice, kind of my own lived experience with the Atlanta shootings and the Asian women who were killed. It looked like my mother-in-law, my friends, my family. And I started to think about people that showed up and in some case showed up with some performative actions and activism. So hopefully a couple pitfalls that I can help you avoid here. So I appreciated those that checked in. Like Jordan said, you know, it's kind of like checking in is so important and how you do it and how you show up is fantastic. But if I'm not ready to talk, you know, don't shy away from checking back in, relooping back around. And if you're checking in with me because, and we've never talked outside of Project A that we're working on, it will wreak performative activism and allyship if you try to initiate a conversation with me when you literally have no idea of my context and my own background. Secondly, also, I don't expect me to have all the answers. Like I have no idea why a person who was, I believe racist walked into a parlor and shot Asian women. I don't have answers. So we need that weight on a woman of color or someone who's been a victim of the community creates more trauma. And then finally, avoid making it about you. So in the spirit of authenticity, show up, ask how I'm doing, but don't turn it around and say, I know how you feel because it's not possible. You have your own experiences within your own context and lived experiences. But again, it will really reap performative allyship and performative activism if you are making it about you. Thank you all. Uh, moving to the next question, Jordan, Pat, and Madeline. Uh, we know that cross-mentoring has value for both mentees and mentors, especially where DEI might be concerned. Um, can you talk specifically how you might have benefited from two-way mentorship? Uh, Jordan, first. Yes, um, and you know, just focusing in on this, I think cross-mentoring, when I think of it, I think of generation-to-generation uh, -generation mentorship. And that's something that is extremely important to me. One idea that I kind of grew to love was the idea of Sankofa. Um, if anyone doesn't know, it is a, a I believe a Ghanaian word, um, which basically means it's not taboo to look to the past in order to go towards your future. So it should not be taboo for me to speak with Pat about things in the workplace that I can do to improve it for the next upcoming generations, because the things that he's lived by, he's already done it, he's already experienced it. Now it's on to me to take those positive notes, those failures and apply it to my life so I'm able to improve it for the people that I laterally network with, people that are my colleagues, and also for the people that come after me. Um, it has benefited me in so many ways possible. Um, being a part of a historically black fraternity, Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Sigma chapter, um, I've been able to speak with uh, Martin Luther King's line brother um, and being able to speak with him about what his activism looked like to him, seeing things that he's done in Boston, speaking with brothers such as um, across the globe. Uh, it, it's been absolutely amazing to speak to people that are 80 years, 70 years, uh, 90 years old and them imparting so much wisdom on you that is so applicable today. And like I said, the civil rights movement never ended. It's just a continuing movement, a continuing lifestyle. Thank you. Uh, Pat? That was beautiful, Jordan. Let me just um, be real brief and feedback. Uh, not only yes, should you feel that way, but that person you turn to should recognize what they can learn from you and how much broader their perspective and their, um, and their uh, empathy can be. Earlier, Simone uh, mentioned two key qualities, curiosity and, and empathy. And great mentors practice radical curiosity and radical empathy. Uh, and they get more than they give in those relationships. Thank you. Uh, Madeline? Yeah, I want to say that um, don't always, I echo everybody's thoughts, but as well, do not always look for people who only look like you, but also look for those who are um, such as diverse because you will learn so much from them. Um, 
either have they walked on your shoes and they can give you that advice as well. And if they have not, um, you can let them know like, hey, this is what's happening to me in the workplace regarding DEI. Um, how can I make this better? Um, this is how I feel. And you can teach people um, what's going on with you. And it's not always a one-way relationship. It's a mutual relationship between both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jordan, Katie, and Pat, we know that employers can be negatively impacted when employees quit and change jobs because of an inflexible workplace culture. What can hiring managers and leaders do to gain perspective, specifically to address the needs of Gen Z in the workplace? Jordan? I um, was kind of grappling with this question because I think it's ever evolving as far as like what we are demanding. I think that COVID has completely added another game into it as far as a hybrid environment. You know, once again, I'm hiring people right now for LinkedIn and something that's consistent is like, hey, is it okay if I don't move to San Francisco? I don't want to, you know, be, live in poverty in San Francisco is so expensive. I want to stay in Atlanta. I'm like, hey, like we can talk about it. We can have that conversation. Also something that's pretty, um, a common question that I receive is, the inclusive nature outside of just that diversity and inclusion, but as far as like having conversations in the workplace, are you actually peers with your coworkers? I think that's something that people, and specifically my generation, is asking for. They want to be able to go grab a beer with their colleague. Um, they want to, you know, have fun with them. They want to uh, be able to experience life with them. Because one thing that I think our generation has focused on is finding somewhere we can fit in, and that's what leads to the turnover. But once we find somewhere we can fit in we'll stay because we feel we feel loved, we feel nurtured, we feel like it's family. Um, and that's one thing that you're going to figure out from Gen Z is that we're not gonna tolerate, and excuse my language, any BS um, from companies. The same way you need us, uh, same way we need you, you really need us. And right now, a lot of people need people to work right now. So true. Uh, Katie and Pat, I'm gonna ask for your concise answers. For me, I think just the tips of with <laughs> truly um, as we return to office and figure out what that looks like, be intentional about programming and really allow for education opportunities to really bridge the differences and figure out how different generations in the workplace are made up, both the different differences and similarities. And then second, if you are a manager, establish social contracts, check back often, build up your cultural and emotional uh, intelligence so that you can establish social contracts right now of how your team should be working right now, define it. How do we create a respectful and inclusive culture? When is your team going to work to be effective and really kind of customize those inclusive needs of each individual on your team? Pat? So ditto to all that, and I'll just be real quick. Uh, United Minds, a firm based in New York, just came out with a study uh, on employee experiences and what employees can and should expect and, uh, and so on. And I would highly commend that to your attention, particularly a point they make about the cost of replacing workers when you haven't met their expectations and the war for talent out there that's getting more and more pronounced. And as Gen Z comes along, watch out if you're not paying more attention to what they aspire to and, and value. Thank you, Pat. Could you put the United Minds info in the chat if you have it? Uh, I'm not gonna move if you have it. It's United Minds. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna move on to our final question. Uh, Pat Jordan and Madeline, uh, any advice for students and young pros looking for a mentor or a sponsor to support and champion them in their workplace and career? Pat? I'll try to be real quick. Number one, you belong. You, you, you belong there and this is, this is not um, a social club, this is a workplace. And so if you, look around and see who seems to have this figured out and just go and engage them and you'll be surprised they want to uh, do second um take risks and and once especially if you've worked out what your purpose is be willing to take risks because you know some of the greatest accomplishments that happens after somebody doesn't get exactly what they want on their first try and so um you know, there's a great uh, writer who said, if you want to keep swimming toward the horizon, you need to have the courage to lose sight of the shore. And as you're heading out in, in, this, in this workplace, you need to keep swimming toward that horizon and don't let uh, uh, minor situations get in your way. Thank you so much. Uh, Jordan? Yes. Um, 
I think it's really important to honestly be humble um, for my generation to understand that once again, it's not taboo to look to the past, but towards the future for older generations to understand, humble yourself. And maybe someone my age can tell you something. I believe Pat uh, mentioned that. Uh, the next thing that is really important is advocate for yourself. No one is going to advocate for you other than yourself, unless you let them know who you truly are. Um, today, I've been on like calls. Uh, there was two young ladies I was helping get jobs at LinkedIn. And the reason why I spent so much time with them on the phone and pushing them through is because they told me about themselves. They told me about their struggle. They told me about their opportunities. They told me about where they want to go. And I said, you fit in here. You can do the job well. Trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make a no allowance for the doubting too. Booyah Kipling if. Thank you. They're so lucky they found you. Madeline? Yeah, um, please take the risk. People are out there to help you, to advocate for you only if you are ready and you're ready to go out there and do the work. Do not be afraid of failure. Failure is a way to learn from your mistakes and be the best person that you can be in your life. Also, reach out to professionals on LinkedIn. They're ready to help you. They're ready to advocate for you. It just takes a simple um, event that you may attend and reference something that they said that, you know, touched you in your heart, um, takes a 15, 30 minute call out of their day. They're there for you. They're here for you. Um, and they're ready to advocate for you. Thank you all for your candor and your eloquence. Uh, wonderful. And now we're going to move to the Q&A uh, part of our discussion. And all of our panelists and our keynote speakers, please turn on your cameras and your mics. Uh, we'll be selecting a few questions from our audience. And audience members, feel free to direct your question to a specific person or group of people um, if you want to hear from them. So I'm going to the Q&A. There's a couple in there, so we're just moving right to it. Aurora, can you describe the relationships with your white friends who have not done the work? We can't hear you. You can't hear me? Oh, no, I can't hear Aurora. Aurora? This is the okay. beauty of work from home right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there she goes. All right, we're ready. Aurora? Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So it's a very simple uh, response. Friends who are not doing the work do not receive an intimate relationship with me, period, end of story. Um, it, is, um, it is too exhausting, it is too energy draining, and life is so, so short. And um, as I have had to do my own work in healing, in understanding as Jordan, and Madeline so beautifully said at different points in understanding myself, I look to friends that are in my community to equally do that work about themselves. Thank you, thank you so much. Our next question uh, comes from Tanya who asks, how do we have these conversations as it pertains to formerly incarcerated women of color looking for a second chance in the workspace? I'm happy to answer that, uh, Professor Applebaum. I think when we have those DEI conversations, I think when it comes to re-entry, it's been a little bit of a slow step in the PR industry um, and comms in general. But uh, for the person who asked that question, you can actually look at Second Chance Studios. They have a digital media program specifically focused on re-entry individuals. Um, also, uh, Columbia Justice Lab also has tons of resources for those who are uh, re-entry citizens who are, who are looking for job opportunities. Um, I'm not sure the person who asked that question, but it is something that's personal and, and near and dear to my heart because my father was incarcerated for, for many years. Um, so he has been someone who has been looking for re-entry work. And so I know a lot and do a lot of PR work in the criminal justice space. Thank you, Troy. Simone and Kelly, this one's for you. Can you name some companies that you consider to be leading best practices, um, having specific examples that uh, our audience can research would be helpful for those of us who are starting uh, to look for uh, work within these organizations? Any recommendations? 
You know, I, I cringe at the word best practices because you can look at what other companies are doing and you can get a list of companies. You can go on Google and find fortune best companies and look at them. But I say that because it's also, you have to look internally in terms of the dynamics of your culture of what's going to move it or, or challenge it, right? From a DEI perspective, even starting the journey. Talking to the leaders, are they invested? Are they willing to do the work? Do they want, even want to spend time doing it? Or is it something that's pushed off to the organization that says, you know, um, nope, that's another group that handles it. We don't really touch it. So you kind of have to look at some of those things. And I love what Jordan shared too, because you have to talk to people. You, things look great on paper and you can, like I said, take the list and, and run with it. But if you're not talking to people to find out what's really happening and doing the research, how are people feeling? How are they being treated? Can they contribute? Do they have values or purpose? Or are they kind of marginalized in some corner? Right? Those are things um, that you also have to take into consideration. So I can tell you a list of names, but then I will say this in terms of there are companies that are doing things well and doing things not so well. So it's not necessarily one company that says, ah, this is it. <laughs> Kelly, uh, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Kelly. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. So Jen asks, how would you respond to an executive team that is reluctant or refuses to pay to hire a DEI advisor with the response, we just don't have the funds. Who wants to take that one? Mm. Okay, Jordan? Uh, I think first off, you have to think of that's completely a lie. Um, you have the funds too. There's people that are willing to do the work for free probably, um, but you should still pay those people. Um, it's really important to have conversations and to be thoughtful as far as what's best for my employees. If you have a lot of turnover, your executive team has a lot of turnover, maybe a DNI advisor is the first step. It's not the end all be all, the solution to the problem, but it's the first step. Then is giving the DEI advisor the actual like pushing the backbone behind them to say like, yo, go out and do what you want to do. Have fun with it. I think a lot of times, a lot of companies, they get scared by electing someone in that position because of making it exclusive to certain people. But you have to remember that the people that this position is specifically for is to help those individuals that have been consistently marginalized their entire lives. It, get Them getting one second of grace is not going to change the systemic barriers that we face on a daily basis right now. Does anyone else want to quickly respond? I have two more questions pending. I always, I always say, do you have $1.8 trillion? Because that's the amount of lost productivity in this country. Or do you have 40% an average for an average salary of a junior professional? Do you have 40% of their salary? Because that's how much it's going to cost you to replace them. Times how many when someone doesn't belong? Anybody else? Quick answer. Okay. Uh, uh, this one's for Katie. Can you speak more on IQEE and the model that you shared? Um, it sounds like a great tool for approaching microaggressions. Sure. So the IQEE model is a model that was uh, created by the Tolerance Center, and it really is a model we can use when acting as an upstander in any type of scenario, whether that's an offense on the street, whether that's a microaggression in the office. And so again, to kind of replay it, IQEE stands for I interrupt. Interrupt something when it's happening. Question, how might you question, excuse me, what did you just say? Um, perhaps you might say, can you clarify for me? It gets the person on the, um, you know, gets kind of the person talking, the offender talking. And then um, E is educate, share facts, share your own experiences to educate the person making that offense. And then echo, when someone else is being an upstander, when someone else is intervening, stand with them, echo them. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, our last question, uh, while it's necessary to spotlight whiteness, uh, this individual wonders what kind of work is necessary so that marginalized, marginalized and not white groups and people can build meaningful relationships with each other. When we only focus on whiteness, is it possible for other intercultural uh, and diversity dynamics to fall through the cracks? Um, is it okay? I, I want to answer this really quickly. I think that 
Um, it's really important for us to understand that race is a social construct. Um, if anyone has read uh, Between the World and Me by ta Coates, he says race is the, race is the child of races, race is the father of ra race is the child of racism, not the father. I think that's something that's really important. There were racists first in order for there to be race. There is nothing biologically different from us that separates black and white. Honestly, it's a superiority and inferiority complex that we have created. Now, something that we can do is promote, similar to what Aurora said earlier, promoting black voices. And I actually have a, like a little pushback with something that I was practicing during the summer is I was actually reading White Fragility. Um, and there was an article that came out during the New York Times, and it was about, it was including Glenn Singleton. Um, he has Courageous, President of Courageous Conversations, also works with work, work Wider, a company that I also work for as well. Um, and he spoke about how it's important to promote Black voices. A lot of times we pay white spaces to take up spaces where Black people have pamphlets and our education for us. Um, so in order to create a space that doesn't focus on whiteness, promote the voices that are already there. Um, so I read, I bought the book, I read it. And then immediately after my girlfriend, Avery, she's probably watching this, made me buy Hood Feminism. Um, such a great book for me to read. Um, and I started to engage more into like these smaller things that were also created. And as a person that has a little background in Afro-Latino culture, um, there's a book called Mama's Girl by Veronica Chambers. I highly suggest for people to read it. Um, it really expands of how diverse the world is and for all of us to come together as far as the diaspora. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to respond to that? Uh, if not, that's our last audience question that I can see. So I'm going to turn this back to, oh yeah, Kelly. Just want to say, Madeline and Jordan, this is our future. This is the future. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. You too. Truly, thank you so much for your insights and everyone else. And, and again, uh, Kelly, Kelly Fuller was the impetus behind this. So uh, major kudos to Kelly Fuller um, for, for being the driver for this event. Um, before we sign off and turn this over to Jenny, I personally want to thank everybody, our keynote speakers and our panelists, uh, inspiring, insightful, so much for us to take away from and a personal honor for me to be a part of, of this opportunity. And so I'm going to say thank you all. I think we turn off our cameras and mics now, right, Jenny? Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks everyone so much for being a part of our show tonight and thanks to our audience for tuning in and for listening to all the vital and insightful conversations that happened this evening. We again like want to thank our sponsors, ProSec, Your Choice Coach, the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communications at the Department of Advertising and Public Relations at University of Georgia, Compro, and Muckrack for making this event possible tonight. Have a great night, everyone, and thanks so much again for joining us. And stay tuned for more Museum of Public Relations events at prmuseum.org. We'll see you soon.